John Hummel, the Cal College French Lit professor who was my undergraduate advisor, informed me that not, un not up for discussion, I was obliged to take three science classes. You could see my heel tracks all the way across the quad. I was indeed going to be a language major. I'd figured out pretty quickly that uh, the goal in life for me was some way that somebody was going to buy me airline tickets and I was going to get to see lots of parts of this planet. And I figured an aptitude for languages was pretty good theory. Learn a lot of them. That will somehow magically turn into you get to go a lot of places. Sounded good at the time. That's not bad for 14 years old. Um, but then came up to Santa Cruz and took Todd Newbury's marine biology course. Todd used, this was you know, the marine biology equivalent of physics for poets. It was the descriptive course for the dummies from the other side of the <coughs> campus. Uh, and he taught it, instead of with a formal textbook, he taught it with an adventure tale. He taught it with Sir Alistair uh, Clark's Great Waters. And I jumped into that book and found three layers all together. A personal memoir of a young man on a grand adventure in the distant reaches of the Atlantic Ocean and the Circum-Pacific uh, Ocean around Antarctica, scientific memoir of an early cruise was in the 1920s, early cruise down through the Atlantic Ocean Islands, looking at all the species on land and in the, in the water column, uh, focusing principally on the krill and the food chain of the Southern Ocean, uh, and a travelogue. And it was just spectacular wild away the second quarter on some highly forgettable math class uh, and then discovered another, another oceans course which was Gary's again descriptive entry-level oceanography. Uh, somewhere along the way in the latter part of that first quarter sort of realizing these two courses really were really cool and I wasn't quite sure what it was triggering. I wasn't quite sure certainly what it meant. I certainly had no idea what a life in the marine sciences would involve or was like other than the one I had read about in Todd's class. So uh, having at that point not a lot of smarts but uh, a fair amount of basic dumb directness, I marched up to Gary one day and said, that was interesting, this is interesting. What exactly do you guys do? I mean, what does be an oceanographer mean? Fortunately for me, you know, of all of the professors on the planet in the late 60s when uh, women were, you know, beyond not much welcome in field camps and way beyond not much welcome on ships or in any sort of significant role, uh, or if you took any, it was always precisely controlled number that related directly to the number of bathrooms that you had declared women could use. The facilities didn't seem to care what gender of person pulled the chain or pushed the lever, but everybody else seemed to care a lot that you will use this one. And so this was a big deal. Uh, and by rights, a, a dumb, innocent 17-year-old freshman girl, arts major, probably would have gotten the back of the hand from countless other professors. But from Gary, I got, oh, we do way cool stuff. What did you like? Oh, let me show you how that works. And we romped for the better part of a day on the one weekend. Uh, through his lab, me mentally going through the different parts of his class and Todd's class and saying, well, what about this? And just rocketing off into a little examination of how do you know that? What do you do? What are the tools like? How do you get that? How do you build an answer around that kind of a question? Uh, by the end of that Saturday, I was hooked and the only remaining test was for sophomore year to find out if I could actually be any good at any of this stuff or I should leave it as a hobby. Uh, happily, the answer turned out uh, to be that it was a great hobby and a great profession. Uh, and although some would consider me a fallen away oceanographer, I don't think I fell very far from the, from the transom. I thought tonight, other than uh, leading off with a favorite painting by a friend, John Lomberg, uh, John did do this before he met me. You can tell he didn't get the underwater part right <laughs> anatomically, but he, he's offered to redo one for me, but it sort of invites conversation about the history of women in these programs, so we've, we've left it alone. Um, my life does have both of these threads uh, still twining through them, not just as a researcher or an administrator, uh, but maybe most of all, from the twin fascinations that, that I find in both realms, and they are pretty succinctly uh, the fascination, to me the mystery, of being able to be as at home and comfortable, just as you are here, in either of these two amazing realms where by rights us soft-bodied critters have no business being. And unless we're clever and smart with our wits and our technology, we will not survive. But to be able to be in extraordinary places behind the 
viewport of an Alvin submersible looking at black smokers at nine, nine degrees north in the Pacific or in orbit looking back at this great planet and just marvel at the ability of clever, creative, curious people uh, to muster technology to let us take ourselves and our intellects to exotic uh, and crazy places. That is just a fascination. And the commonalities and differences of the technologies that let us do that uh, continue to be uh, an interest of mine. Tonight, uh, having all of us spent some time in the oceanic realm, I thought I would focus more specifically on the space arena, although you can't do that without also taking a look back at our home planet. So we'll do a bit of that as well. Field trips have all sorts of interesting beginnings. <laughs> it's probably a little different than setting off for a drive down Western Avenue and a climb down the cliff. And it's certainly different than when a research ship slips her bow lines and eases gracefully away from the dock. You know you're going somewhere when this one starts. Uh, <laughs> This is right around the moment of ignition. We'll take some close-up looks at this in a moment, but for any of you not studied space shuttles closely, this little volume right in here is the only volume in all of that stuff that you see that can hold pressure, hold air pressure, hold an atmosphere inside of it, and it's the only place that people, any smart people, really want to be right at this moment. Uh, everyone else on the planet is at least five miles away at the moment of this, and that is because anything inside five miles is affectionately known as the blast danger area. The strange thing is, the five to seven people who are up here in the pointy end are really happy to be there at this crazy moment. It's, a, it's an odd thing. I want to step back from this moment for just one second and give you a little broader zoomed out view of this moment because the people who dare and dream of and conceive of and then dedicate themselves to great adventures is another bit of a thread that's been mentioned in, by both of the previous speakers that I too would like to weave tonight. So here's a control center. Engineers, average age, uh, it's aging these days, but average age in this room in Mission Control Houston when I was flying, front room console operator, was about a 29, maybe 30 year old engineer. It takes three to four years to certify to be sitting in one of these seats uh, during any true flight phase. You can practice there, but the full certification takes that long. But what I want to draw your attention to is this picture. This is mission control during an actual active countdown. Uh, this is in Houston. Houston is not in control through the countdown. That's uh, all being done in Florida. But there's a, the best elegant forward pass that's ever thrown on the planet happens right at liftoff. When that part of the space shuttle, the tip of the tail, passes that top of the tower on that launch pad, it's about six and a half seconds after ignition. The orbiter's already doing about 100 miles an hour. And at that instant, Florida's done and Houston takes over. And so Houston takes part step by step in the last uh, about 24 hours of a countdown and there's a lot of planning and coordination obviously before that there's a lot of caucusing about the status of the vehicle and agreement on everything being ready to go but in that instant those guys take control and these guys as you can see here are reduced to just watching their handiwork leave and that actually is <coughs> discovery uh, with me and five, four other crew members in the Hubble Space Telescope aboard. We had a launch hold at 31 seconds that almost prevented the vehicle from going uh, and only very quick detective work uh, on indicators that the vehicle was sending out uh, let us get off the pad that day. Well, back to the pointy end goes forward part of the world. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, powered portion of flight, five, ma five engines burning in parallel, the short version of the story is seven million pounds of thrust pushing four million pounds of stuff off of the planet, zero to two thousand miles an hour in sixty seconds, and then two thousand to four thousand in the next sixty seconds, four to six, six to eight, and so on, uh, zero to seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. Uh, this works, it's cal just realized. It's California, I can use my favorite description. It's a magnitude 4.5 earthquake with three G's acceleration on top of it. <laughs> That's about what it is. It is shake, rattle, and roll, and, <clears throat> and it is tremendously loud despite the fact that you have the outer skin of the orbiter the inner eggshell that's holding all the air and your own helmet and pressure suit <coughs> that purportedly have significant sound suppressing qualities uh, but 
not that much sound. Uh, it's a very good ride. These guys are very percussive and it really is, that's the magnitude 4.5 earthquake part. Once the solids drop off about two minutes in, these liquid fueled main engines burn like the world's uh, best European electric train. And it's a very smooth, very fast ride. That picture is all of about a, a minute and a half after launch, you're already uh, basically entirely through the atmosphere, well above 400,000 feet. The, the apparent arcing over and flattening out of the trajectory is, is actual. You want to get up through most of the density of the air quickly. You then want to give up the buying of altitude for a bit to accelerate out to orbital velocity, and then you push up again at the final injection point for your orbit uh, to have the right flight path angle. This is the uh, orbiter itself, Endeavour in this case, and uh, Endeavour is rigged here for rendezvous and assembly of a segment of the space station. This is the airlock and the docking adapter. That silver ring right there is what mates mechanically to a matching half on the uh, station itself. And this thing here that looks sort of like a lozenge in the payload bay is one of the major solar array truss segments that was being ferried up on this flight. I'll come back and talk some more about space station and the challenges of assembling uh, such a large structure on orbit. But this gives you a good sense of the orbiter. Again, this is the only habitable volume of the orbiter normally. We'll look inside there in a moment. Uh, the radiator panels here are the key thing that have to be deployed in operating to turn the rocket ship, the up and down vessel, into an orbiting laboratory. They're the integral elements of the heat rejection system so that you can get the metabolic heat and the electronics heat out away from the orbiter and into deep space. All of the rest of the orbiter, both underneath this payload bay and in the back end here, is the uh, electronics and rotary machinery that power all the different systems. This is inside the orbiter on the upper deck. If you look forward on that upper deck, you can see airline type windows, the sort of typical, uh, initially very bewildering array of switches and, uh, and dials. This is the original equipment on Discovery. Uh, she's since been outfitted with the sort of current day corporate jet glass cockpit. Um, about 1,500 switches, dials, and circuit breakers, very much sort of like a 747 or 777 cockpit looking forward, and that is really the launch and landing station. On orbit, as you can see, you fold seat backs down, you put storage bags out to help tuck and, and park the things that you're going to need to have out for your working day. The next picture is taken looking back to the vantage point of this uh, view, and you'll see that, in fact, the flight deck of the orbiter is a 360 degree cockpit. Uh, these are the circuit breakers and switches you are seeing here. Computers, flight controls, you can fly the orbiter looking backwards or looking up through the ceiling as well as looking forwards. That's only used for rendezvous and docking on orbit. And normally in a position here and just behind me, the hand controllers that run the robot arm. Uh, TV monitors, every airplane I've ever sat in in my life, starting with the Cessna 150 when I was about 12, on first blush just looks unfathomable. There's way too much stuff here, it's just a blur, and you can't imagine you're ever really going to digest all of this and know what's going on. By the time you actually fly on the orbiter, you know it like you know the light switches in your own house or the controls on your own stove. It's clear, it's intuitive. Uh, you know it down to the level of how many wires lead from each switch so that if a wire fails, how much more redundancy do you have? And notwithstanding knowing it that well, you never, ever, ever do anything without a checklist and preferably some crew crewmate with their chin parked right on your shoulder doing a double check and confirm. Uh, the guys who train us, train astronauts, are very fond of keeping a big banner in their offices that says, we give our final exams at 17,500 miles an hour on national television, and we would usually go by and write in with no instant replays. So it's, uh, the other, one of the good astronaut mottos is if you ever really, if you ever want to do this a second time, it would be a really good idea to do it right this time. <laughs> Down below is an area that's called the, the mid-deck, uh, not being cute, there actually is another level below that floor, it's just an equipment bay with the fans and pumps and water tankage and things like that. Uh, you know, there's no Maytag repairman here. There's the guys who built the orbiter and assemble it are not here, but neither is the Maytag repairman. So 
you own it, you operate it, you fix it, you clean it, uh, you're given a full up working spaceship in spanking clean condition when you leave, uh, and both for health and safety reasons and just the professional pride you pass to other members of the team, you bring back a full up healthy work and, and clean uh, spacecraft when you're done. The mid-deck serves every imaginable purpose. You can see here a student experiment, a high school student's experiment that we're operating in this flight. I'm changing film inside an IMAX camera. There's sleeping bags strapped to the starboard bulkhead. There's some various bits of food packages still Velcroed around the walls. That's an exercise treadmill underneath me here. Uh, this is discovery before the airlock, when the airlocks were mounted inside this mid-deck. So that's the inner back door, if you will and the airlock when you're not busy doing spacesuit preparations just becomes a nice handy stowage volume or sleeping place. So every imaginable function on the mid-deck and if you're on a normal typical sortie space shuttle flight the two places you've seen are the total living volume of the craft. That's about equivalent to uh, three rows of seats and is about the plan form size of that mid-deck. And if I stood there and put my hands up with a little bit of tiptoes, I could touch the overhead. So you and up to six or seven of your closest personal friends can spend from seven to 21 days in this nice cozy place. And if you weren't close personal friends before, you will be afterwards. The mid-deck has galley. This is actually the food rehydration and warming station. And you can see you know, life without Velcro and duct tape in space would be absolutely impossible. Uh, we'll take a look later at the very cool things that your food can and will do. But sometimes you actually want to stay where you wanted it, and that's where the Velcro comes in. Um, dinner is one of the interesting things in zero G. This is my third crew in a tip half of it, the other half's upstairs working in a typical dinner arrangement. And one of the fun things is, you know, the, the, the fun about no up and down is just really quite delightful. Charlie, uh, Charlie Bolden and I had by this time, we're each on our third flight, we had adopted a policy that whenever eating in zero G, you should never ever eat in any geometry that faintly resembles seated at a table, simply because you can. And so you would always find us perched up around the ceiling somewhere. Uh, Brian is a rookie, so he's kind of a little more down in, in the wanting to know how this works. And uh, Dirk is also a rookie and was, I must say, great guy, very, uh, very able physicist and atmospheric physicist from Belgium. Uh, but the least comfortable and least adapted human being to zero-g I've probably ever seen. This is about day nine of the flight and he still has to have his feet anchored somewhere and you could see the muscles straining and just never quite got the idea that if you will just stop moving, you really will stop moving. And so he, he was always a little bit like a starfish with a sort of five-point attachment to something solid, which took probably 90% of the fun out of it. Uh, nowadays, of course, there is uh, a destination of sorts, at least, in low Earth orbit. This is the International Space Station, actually, in its current geometry. Well, that truss segment we saw in Endeavour's payload bay was that kind of element right there. Uh, there are three truss segments in the picture here. One of the four major solar arrays is already up there, about four of the different modules and the robotic arm. Uh, that's the configuration it will stay in uh, unless or until space shuttles fly again. There is no other launch craft on the planet, none, that can lift pieces of the size, the physical size, the volume, and the weight of the space station segments uh, and bring them into a rendezvous configuration. <coughs> Furthermore, every one of these assembly steps has both a, a tinker toy kind of plug and play mechanical connection to it, but also a myriad fluid and electrical lines that are frankly connected by hand by spacewalking astronauts. And we'll take a little look at that in a moment. Inside the space station, quite a different experience. Uh, this is inside the US laboratory module. This is the control station for the robot arms. Uh, you can see laptops are the rule of the day for control on the space station. It's uh, an entirely networked control structure. Uh, typical, almost commercial off the shelf. Uh, laptop computers, they're radiation hardened and a few other things to stay stable in this operating environment. Uh, on the orbiter, control alt delete would at any point in time would be a really not fun idea, <laughs> especially on landing. When you're in stable coasting flight on a space station, it's not a maneuvering craft really. 
a computer outage of some duration uh, is definitely a problem. It's the whole central nervous system of your life support system, but it is not a, a dynamics and stability problem. So you have a little more time uh, to deal with things in an orderly fashion. Uh, you can see uh, one of the crew here cruising through the hatchway to the node, and you might just notice the labels. It's interesting trying to build a module like this. The outer shape of it is cylindrical. The inner shape clearly is not. It's square. And you have to just adopt some conventions. So the convention that's been adopted is you're going to declare one surface is the floor. And you see a label there that actually says deck. Now, when you're assembling this thing on the, at the Cape Kennedy Space Center, that looks like the stupidest label you've ever seen. You know, everything is going to drop on that surface when you let it go. Housekeeping systems, the backbone of the station itself, uh, pumps and fans and electrical live underneath the floor and in the overhead. Experimental and mission related systems live in the port and starboard wall. But once you've been in zero G a little bit and when you can swim from module to module and your face as you swim in could be pointing as this guy's is or that way or that way or any other way and you, you can actually get terribly disoriented squirting through the nodes that connect the modules and so you actually have directional labels that hatch takes you to node one. There's another hatch at the other end of this module. And you have reminders about which of these surfaces we have declared to be the deck or the port or the starboard so that you can quickly orient yourself as you come flying through these hatches. Uh, cluttered, as you can see, this is inside the base block. This, this module is actually provided by uh, the, the Russians, it's the habitability and sort of repair kit and dining area of the station. And this is uh, Ken Bauer socks with all sorts of stuff floating around. A progress supply vehicle has just recently arrived and they're in offloading phase. Uh, so, you know, stuff can just be parked. These are bags of water, actually. So stuff can kind of be just parked around or left floating until you're ready for it. If it's massive enough, it won't go very far in the air currents. It will all move, but it won't go very far in the air currents. Lost and found is a fairly simple thing, certainly on the space shuttle. Lost and found of anything this size, stray goldfish, crackers, stray M&Ms, your sock, a pencil. You get to know pretty quickly the few stagnant spots in the airflow. You give it about a half a day. You go fish around in one of those stagnant spots, and unless one of your helpful crew members snagged it, it'll be right there. <laughs> A little different with larger mass objects like the stowage bags that SOX has. Here's a, another view, a little, little different phase of operations in a different segment of that base block, but again, pretty cluttered, pretty tight, roomy compared to the shuttle in a lot of ways, uh, but still fairly tight, a little more, a little more reminiscent of a shipboard experience. But compare it to this. This is what the inside of the space station mirror looked like in the year before reentry. Uh, one of my friends and former crewmates, the guy who will command Expedition 8 on the space station, Mike Fole, did six months on Mir. Mike is a windsurfer and he has a Volkswagen Vanagon that he straps his boards on and goes down to Corpus Christi. And Mike came up with the world's best concise description of Mir at this stage of its life. He said, you want to imagine going off on a camping trip in your Vanagon for 11 years with no trash rejection. <laughs> So you see, so you can tell here as they extended the modular, the racetrack modular array of mirror, they'd never built the airflow circuit to handle all of that, and so they just brought up big, you know, dryer ducts and ran more air ducts, which is great for air circulation. It becomes a little bit of a problem when you have to do an emergency hatch close because you punctured one of these modules, and you want a good idea to not let all the air out. The other thing to think about is to remember there is no such thing as down. No, your hall closet needs no shelves. Every surface in this room can be a stowage surface if you have tape and Velcro. It is, you know, the hall closet from hell growing out at you from all sides <laughs> over 11 years. Now, here's the, here's the sociological piece I want you to think about. You've all had this happen. It's been a dinner party or, you know, after a death in the family when people are over and helping out around the house for a while and finally they all leave and you go to find where on God's great earth they put the knives or the carving board or whatever it is, helpful people that they were, because not where you expected. I want you to imagine being the 17th crew that takes over Mir, or for that matter, replacement crews on the space station, with a high efficiency plan set out for you because the time is expensive and the, the cost of getting people there uh, force it to have to be productive time. Where is the spare film? 
you know, where are which foodstuffs, where are what clothing stuff. The logistics tasks of making these environments run effectively are astonishingly complex and aboard Mir, not usually terribly well done, frankly. Uh, but back to the current space station configuration, this gives you another sense of how large the insides of the module is. This is the same module we saw earlier, but months prior to the last shot when some of the major scientific uh, equipment racks are still being installed. Uh, the basic game plan of, of the space station is like a research ship, but with experiments swap out at sea. So you can reconfigure from one theme of, of investigation to another over yearly or decadal cycles. That device, by the way, weighs about 850 pounds. You can see it's easily moved by a couple of folks with fingertip <coughs> forces, courtesy of zero G. Uh, this is the Maytag repairman shot. You know, it is you. If it breaks, you're going to fix it. And so the uh, training and skill on space station systems, on maintenance, also on maintenance of the human beings. Uh, all of the crew members on a space station segment will have full EMT training. You're not, you don't really yet have any techniques to master surgical kinds of interventions, fluids management uh, for a surgical or a puncture wound kind of situation in zero gravity is still an, an unsolved set of problems. Uh, but on a space station, you might really have to stabilize somebody for something measured in tens of hours or days before you could deorbit and bring them home. On a space shuttle, the philosophy, of course, would be the crew member is paramount and you would stabilize them for just as few revolutions around the planet as you needed to have an available runway. Back to zero G. Things your mother would let you do in zero G that she would never have let you do at the dinner table. Uh, this is Joe Allen, and that is a ball of orange juice. Uh, nice ball of color fluid about the size of a golf ball it will give you the world's absolutely best three-dimensional hockey, world air hockey game. Uh, it is way fun. Obviously, the rules are air only. Uh, it's not just for being cute, it's for this reason. If you leave the fluid out on its own away from a container in zero-g hydrostatic forces and all the good laws of uh, fi fluid physics that we know, it'll settle itself very happily into a nice little ball and it will very much want to stay there. There is a force that is stronger than hydrostatic force and is the surface tension force. And so Jeff Hoffman has illustrated here what's going to happen if you try to cheat in air hockey and move it with any part of your body. As soon as you bring any solid surface near that fluid sphere, as you watch it happen, you absolutely would swear that the fluid jumps onto the surface. And I know that's not what the physics says is happening, but boy, is that what it looks like. Uh, it just hops on there and clings. So air hockey is great. Um, goldfish crackers, there's by this point nobody on planet Earth that doesn't know goldfish crackers. Pepperidge Farm goldfish will display schooling behavior in this environment. <laughs> they will. And they will do long distance cross countries because if someone back there wanted one, you just tap on it and just drifts gracefully all the way across the room. And then you can sort of do hockey again. You can eat a goldfish out of the water like a goldfish will eat its food out of it. It's just very fun stuff. I'm sure my mother would have forgiven me. So any duration stay in zero gravity uh, requires a lot of consideration for uh, our own anatomy and physiology. Uh, the fluids that are have a certain equilibrium distribution within our bodies here, either seated or standard in 1G, take on a whole new distribution. In 0G, your heart enlarges, circulation patterns change, a whole range of uh, uh, subtle biochemical endocrinal, endocrinal changes that this geologist is too dumb to tell you too much about. Uh, but a lot of the internal sensors that control the chemical and fluid balances of our body are affected and altered to a different equilibrium as the fluids uh, shift north in your body. The other thing is the subtle musculature of our, mainly our thighs and our lower abdomen that keep the right proportion of blood between our heart and our head as we sit and stand here in 1G, they relax. In fact, the best way to simulate that sort of uh, phenomena of zero gravity is extended bed rest. You just let that muscle tone atrophy a little bit. And as you probably know from times you've been in bed ill for a while, the first time you stand suddenly back up in gravity, you'll feel a bit woozy as the fluids race for your feet. So lower body exercise in particular is a very important protocol to follow. The trick is what type of exercise actually will get the right mix of muscle flex and tone and circulation pumping. And so you see here one of the devices, this is on the shuttle, that's been worked with quite a bit to see how well that would do. It's a bicycle ergometer. 
and Katie's got her toes clipped in here. There's actually not a seat on the bike, and if you need proof of that, I'll sh this is Susan Still using the same ergometer to do upper body exercise. Uh, just point your feet north and use it with your hands. Uh, but it, it's turned out to take some more subtle equipment design to get the right kind of mix of uh, cardiovascular circulation and muscle strain to keep that lower body condition where you need it to be. The Soviets over the years tried things like basically too short, pant, too short of a pair of pants on a suit with elastic bands down the inseam and outer seam so that to hold the neutral posture your body wants to be in in zero-g, you actually had to exert a little bit of work against that suit to see if that sort of isometric could help maintain a tone in the leg. Uh, lower body negative pressure devices have been tried. It's sort of like an inverse iron lung where you get in a pneumatic device up to about your, your rib cage or your shoulders and you put a few tenths uh, PSI lower pressure in that than you have around the rest of you to pull fluid back down towards your feet. Uh, still some things uh, being variable resistive devices being experimented with now to see how they will retain tone for people on the space station. What happens when you come home after six months? Well, you know, it varies. It varies by individual condition and physiology, and it, and it varies by the protocol you did or didn't follow on orbit. In the early days of the Soviets putting people in zero-g for six to 12 or 13 months, they would sometimes have to lift guys out of the capsule when they landed on the steps. More recently, uh, crews have landed after 180 to 240 days uh, on the station climbed out of the capsule and piloted aircraft back from Baikonur and the landing zone of the Soviet Union. Uh, Shannon Lucid, a classmate of mine who flew a, a Mir segment a couple of years ago, 188 days. At the time, the flat out, hands down, U.S. endurance record landed on a Wednesday, had follow-up medical tests on a Thursday, was back to Houston Friday and was you know, running errands, working in the garden and shopping groceries on Saturday sort of never batted an eye, so it does vary quite a bit. You do feel your inner ear coming back into gear. The semicircular canals in your head that, that tell your brain what you just did as you moved your head around don't function in zero gravity, and so your brain and body learn to adapt to only using the visual picture that you see. But as soon as you get back into a G field, that device kicks in again, and your brain has to be reminded how to mix that signal with the visual one. And so for, in my case, five to 10 day flights, for an hour or two, if you moved your head real quickly or if, as you're walking this way, looked sideways, you'd, you'd get erroneous signals. You would sort of feel like the ship had rolled and indeed you could usually see people walk along and you know, glance to the right or left and sort of throw a foot out to pre <laughs> and then quickly recover. And you'll also see people forgetting that they can no longer send this flashlight across the room. <laughs> and being absolutely astonished that it ends up at their toes. Sleeping is another one of those great, this is, this is not a stage shot, this is actually Mark Garneau dead flat asleep, drifting around the mid-deck on the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1984. Not many switches down there, our skipper didn't mind, and so Mark would just kind of drift around in the air currents. Uh, the circulation pattern would bring, try to bring him up to the upper deck through the port side access hatch, he's too, He's too big to go through there in that geometry. So if you were going down below to get water or use the potty uh, at night, you would meet Mark at the hatch, usually his backside at the hatch. Uh, the nice thing is, you know, thumb and forefinger, light touch on any piece of the clothing, and he's gone, he's drifting away, he's oblivious, won't wake up at all, works like a charm. The crews that spend a longer time, with shuttle missions, the, the crew training, crew selection, and sort of sociological factors that you have to consider for five, 10, even 15 or 20 day shuttle flights are quite, quite different than for extended duration station flights. And it's been a severe learning curve in a lot of ways for NASA. Uh, probably one of the dividends that came from flying with the Soviets during the Mir phase was seeing the very different ways that they handled those phenomena and those realities. Shuttle crews, I'm gonna put the people together that I need. It's five to seven people. I'm going to pay something between not very much and none at all attention to whether you like each other. Not my problem. We got a lot of things to get done. I expect you to focus on that. You can josh each other. You can be nice to each other. You can sort of chew on and hate each other. I don't really care. Get it done, get it done right. You don't have to talk to them when you get home. Not my problem, let's go. Can't do that here. 
Uh, there is nowhere to get away. Uh, you're going you're to be gone for a 10-day business trip. Mm, few really severe things in life are likely to happen fortuitously in those 10 days. You're going to be gone for 3 to 6 to 9 to 12 months. Big things can happen. Frank Culbertson sat up on the space station and watched September 11th unfold. Jim Voss sat up on the space station and had to hear about uh, and uh, be patched into the hospital to try to talk to a guy he flew with three times who was dying of cancer. Big things happen when you're up there and you can't get home. So a lot more care is taken uh, to private conferences with the families. Uh, my flying days, there was, you had no private communication of any sort with anybody. It was hard to have a truly private communication with a flight surgeon, the sort of American philosophy and the media's sense of entitlement to any communication from the vehicle, any communication from a crew member was very hard to push back against. For space station crews, that's improved a lot. There's direct email to and from their families through a, a certain, uh, private gateway, not a controlled gateway. Carl Waltz, as you can see, has got his keyboard. He's a great piano player. He is the astronaut office official Elvis impersonator. Uh, he does it quite well. Uh, so time is spent pacing of the schedule is different, more autonomy to manage the schedule within certain parameters for themselves as accorded to the crew, day off rotations, the normal things you would think about but that have not historically been normal planning factors, at least in the American space program. This thing is big. The piece that you saw in that uh, approach picture is the center segment and these first two segments of the truss and a little bit of this core of modules and one of these solar arrays that is for the time being mounted up here instead of at its normal location. So about that much of the space station is what's up there right now. This is its intended full size. 108 meters across, 80 meters um, um, that way in length, fore and aft, 456,000 kilograms of mass to orbit. And it is big scale stuff. You know, there's a six foot crew member on the end of the space shuttle's manipulator arm uh, in part of the task of installing this, the manipulator arm that lives on the space station. You can see the size of one of the solar array segments here nearby for comparison. Uh, Here's a guy who's flying around on the end of the, sh of the station arm, taking a hand off some equipment from the uh, orbiter's arm. Uh, NASA's just in the last couple months had asked me to come back down to Houston, get recertified in the underwater, this suit, but the underwater training suit, uh, and evaluated against some space station tasks so I could then compare it to some candidate new suits for designing and give them a, an assessment about which way to go on some things. So I had the chance in July of this year, back down in Houston to hop in this pool. It's 200 feet long, it's 100 feet wide, it's 40 feet deep. Essentially the entire current space station geometry is submerged in this end of the pool and other major components ranging from a full-size orbiter payload bay or the Hubble telescope can be submerged in this end of the pool. You suit up. These are true, genuine, full and for real spacesuits. They've had the computer pack taken off, the life support backpack taken off and mock-ups that carry out the right shape so you, you know how big you are in the back and you have the right visual geometry are put on. And pockets of lead weights. These pockets around the ankles here contain lead weights. There's lead in the backpack, lead in the chest pack so you can be ballasted out to be exactly neutral no matter what geometry you're in and it's never quite perfect. The uh, learned lesson becomes if you can overcome the viscous uh, the water displacement, viscous drag, and the fact that your way out is never going to be perfect and get your task done with no errors, no gaps, and on the timeline in the tank. It's kind of like training for a wind sprint with a parachute on your back. Once you let the parachute go, you'll, you'll really find it easy to make task and make time on orbit. But the space station tasks are incredibly complex, incredibly demanding uh, and very demanding on this suit which was never meant to have to work through such an array of reaches and stretches and forces and torques that have to be imposed. That suit right there fully charged for real on orbit weighs 350 pounds. Every time you move, and it is a bit like swimming around a jungle gym, but to move your body you have to move your body's mass plus the 350 pounds of the suit. Well how hard is that? If you put, if I gave you a spacesuit glove and you put your hand in it unpressurized and tried to grip something, 
whatever your grip strength is sitting here today would be reduced by 50%, half, before we pressurize the glove. And then remember, your hand is the most important tool you have. Your feet are borderline useless in a zero-G setting. So everything you're doing from moving along to picking up a tool to opening a tether hook and hooking it on and unhooking it is just repetitive wrist grabs at about a 10 pound, five pound, 10 pound squeeze just to close your hand. So what you wear out are your forearms and you wear them out fast. Underwater works for a number of these tasks, but with the acreage, the complexity, and the degree of detail of the station tasks, you, you not only need to be more skilled and have better memory and, and better procedural skill, but you need to coordinate much more carefully with your crewmates inside the, the cabin. You can't possibly remember all this stuff. There's not a heads-up display on the suit. You can't possibly put enough pages on a checklist on your cuff. So you end up with a lot of to and fro coordination with someone in the station helping you out. That's an issue right now when the station is only manned with two folks because of the resupply problems imposed by the orbiter fleet being grounded. Virtual reality has become an indispensable element of training in these circumstances. You can have, and they do have, the entire CAD CAM design and fit out database for the space station uh, stored in the CAD CAM. You can mate it up with CAD CAM of the shuttle payload bay. You can incorporate the geometries of the robot arms. We can have the guy there who's going to be reading me my procedure and Gary who's flying the arm around. And when we need to, Gary can see my field of view. And you, we can each really get skilled at what is this going to be and how are we going to need to work together. And not only virtual reality for the human beings, but another variant of what we may see for spacewalks a decade or more into the future is a device called a robonaut. I want you to imagine the guy in the spacesuit you saw underwater, but only from his rib cage up. And the bottom is just a, a socket, a mechanical socket that one of those robot arms could grab. The upper torso is a robot with a spectacular broadband vision system and very hand-like um, hands and arms being operated by a remote operator in a VR sense from inside the spacecraft. So whether it's pre-positioning tools or setting up a work site to cut down the amount of time we need the real human out in a payload bay or out in a spacesuit, or whether it's force multiplier, so it's one human being and two robonauts coordinating together, uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. It's under development right now and in the test phase down at NASA's labs with Nancy Curry and a bunch of folks working through the protocols and the hardware. Well, the world's greatest pastime on orbit is this one looking out the window, and this is one of the ways in which the space shuttle beats the station hands down. More windows, better windows, and pointed in better directions. Whether it's just gazing out the window as you go over the Hawaiian Islands, this is every island in the chain, or the Middle East, you know, all of it, broad panorama, sweeps of whatever your interest is, sweep of history, sweep of current politics, sweep of geology, there it is. Uh, moments later, or here we are, all of Baja, California, we're right there. There's the Sierra Crest. Trust me, trust me for real and out the window and on the original image, you could see Shasta. Here's the little bit, bit of the jet stream cruising across. There's Guadalupe Island. I mean, you know, what do you want to see? So, you know, there, and, and you do what everybody would do. You get to the window the first time without fail. I don't care how many degrees you have. The first remark is, it looks just like maps. <laughs> <laughs> Except California isn't pink, go figure. But then it, you know, nose prints. You clean nose prints off windows four or five times a day because people come up and say, look, 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 that's where I went to college. Or you know, if, you, if you don't like the panoramic view, you can look straight down and go, look, 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 that's where I went to graduate school. That's Halifax. I can show you where I sailed. I can show you Peggy's, Peggy's Cove, where sadly the uh, Swiss Air flight went down is right there. So what do you want to see? Detail or, uh, or panorama, both are spectacular. Here's a little detail, that's Everest. That, that right there is Everest. From a spaceship with a handheld camera through three panes of glass at 18,000 miles an hour, that kind of detail. Uh, or the Nile, Nile Delta, we saw that in panorama a few slides back. There's the Suez Canal, there's the you know, current mouth of the Delta, all these little dots are villages. This little bigger dot is Cairo, and those little tiny dots there are the pyramids. If you use the lens that you just had looking at Everest, you can see the pyramids in their shadow. 
the myth that all you can see that's man-made from orbit is the Great Wall of China beats me. It's actually one of the harder things to see. You can see all kinds of things that us two-footed carbon-based life forms have done down here. Uh, the atmosphere edge on. Got to remember something here. You're going around the planet once every hour and a half. You get a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes whether you need it or not. And at every one of those, you get a great opportunity to look at the limb of the Earth with the sun. You're, you're like the satellite that's occulting the sun. You're going around so fast, the sun's going to set for you. And so you can see the prismatic effects of the layers of the atmosphere. You don't normally see this picture. This is very unique. This is, uh, you will typically see this horizon that's the top of the troposphere, the tropopause. You won't typically see such distinct horizons upper in the stratosphere and the mesosphere, more, more a continuous gradation sort of like that one there. But you see them very distinctly here because it's about 14 months after Mount Pinatubo erupted and there's still such a quantity of aerosol in the upper atmosphere that's acting as a tracer on these uh, inflection points in the density gradient ample sign of the uh, active star that we uh, fly around and all the different ways it bathes us with uh, particulate energy as well as the, the radiative energy. This is actually the southern aurora uh, and even going by at, at five miles a second you see the curtains oscillate. There was reminded me of a big heavily brocaded opera curtain hung in deep folds with a little breeze. They oscillate in shape and, and form. They wax and wane in brightness and height. Uh, you can't quite see, maybe just see a bit of the reddish fringe here and the greenish fringe here, those two, the two distinctive oxygen bands at 59, 20, and 60, 30, or whatever. They're probably off on that by a bit. But very fun, you know, if an alien dropped into orbit around our planet and knows physics the way we do, that would confirm oxygen uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, one of the very memorable moments on my last flight was when I was off shift but up on the flight deck getting in people's way so I could look out the window and we were coming uh, into the auroral oval and there was one thin curtain that came up out of the rest of the oval and we were headed right for it and in the course of about 15 seconds I'm looking at this green fence it's off in the distance and you can as you can see here you, you see the striations very clearly it just looks like a nice feathered fence and then in an instant we were right smack dab edge on it and it was like looking down the edge of a piece of paper and I you know, just about put my hand on a Bible and swear that I saw the gyro radius of a stratospheric, mesospheric electron plumbing down that field line and then you're past it again and it, you felt like you pole vaulted over the aurora, it's very cool. And of course, of course, of course, uh, the oceans. This is actually a picture that was taken from Mir, that's uh, an artifact from how many times I've shown this slide before I finally got it scanned. That's a projector bulb trying to burn through. But these are the Falkland Islands. You're looking from east to west. Just truncated off the top of the picture would be the tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego and southern Argentina. And all of this, all of this stuff, all of this milk in your coffee stuff is plankton. It's a spectacular plankton bloom in the Falklands current. You think about what's happening here with the pinch point between the Antarctic Peninsula and Tierra del Fuego, the interplay of the Antarctic bottom water and Atlantic water, add in a little bit of Coriolis force, and you get the spectacular mixing of these cold, nutrient-enriched waters swirling up, finally making it into the photic zone and just blooming. Uh, shift gears a little bit uh, and bring this to a close. You know, art sometimes captures some of the important lessons of our lives in ways that uh, are hard to beat any other way. This is a painting that was done in uh, the early 1950s at the beginning of the space race to sort of inspire and motivate the American people about what might be ahead in space. It's 1951 to be exact. World War II has been over for six years. The only things faintly resembling space flight that have happened yet are V1 and V2 ballistic weapons. Uh, it is 10 years, what's, it's six years to Sputnik, it's 10 years to Gagarin, it's 11 years to the first thing faintly resembling a weather satellite. None of this has happened yet. Werner von Braun's got some ideas, Willie Lay's got some other ideas, Chesley Bonnestel paints this painting to capture von Braun's vision, Southern Mexico, Central America, a space station, a space plane, the art, accompanying article in Collier's Magazine describes how this all works. This is the craft that brings people up and back to the space station and shuttles back and forth. This funky thing that looks like somebody disassembled an Advil capsule uh, is a telescope. 
that's been put above the atmosphere. Lyman Spitzer started talking about that at Princeton in 1949. I came in contact with this painting some uh, 34 years later when a guy who knew all these folks uh, was charged by President Reagan to lead the next 30 year look ahead about what might happen, knew of this painting and said, you know, it'd be really fun to take a little bit backward look and remind ourselves how much we undershot or where we overshot, where we slowed ourselves down, where we've accomplished things. So he got Bob McCall, arguably America's premier space artist today. Bob came along and did this update to that picture. So it's not the, you know, it, it's not the 2001 Arthur C. Clarke space station. It's this one. That's actually what the space station on the drawing boards looked like at the time. Uh, it's not quite that shape of a winged spacecraft, strange winged space plane, and it ain't black, it's white, but it's called a space shuttle. And this is actually what the Hubble telescope looked like, then actually a real thing, almost finished being assembled out here in California. And this little guy over here, you know, that's Bruce McCandless. He'd just done that about a year before, buzzing around in a little backpack uh, away from all the vehicles. And I stepped into this picture and was taken just wonderfully taken aback. The first one was painted in the year I was born. None of those things had happened. They were still in the category of fictions and imaginations, just about of the same ilk of any of the early Greek philosophers or da Vinci or anybody you'd like to think about. And in 33 years, which is not much of an American lifespan, and from 26 to 33 ain't much of a, of a segment of a professional lifespan, you know, me and a few thousand other folks that just kind of thought it'd be funky and cool and a dare and a challenge and bring lessons and insights about ourselves and our planet that were worth having as a, as a species and as a country, uh, we had made all this stuff happen for not in X years, but for the first time ever in the history of all of humanity. These things were happening simply because people of curiosity and dedication and passion decided to take it on and try to make it so and found the conviction to persevere and carry on and carry on and carry on. The, the tenacity is 90% of the game in any of these grand quests. Well, it still boils down to this. It boils down to people that look up, that look out, that have questions, and that will muster the talent and the energy and the resources to reach for those and to learn about them. It takes a certain strange, nowadays seems kind of strange, optimism to do that. Helen Keller, you know, People who never did certain things sometimes capture their essence in the most astonishing ways. Da Vinci, who of course never got any higher than maybe climbing a tree, it's Da Vinci who wrote, once you've tasted flight, you will ever after walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, for there you have been and there you will always long to return. And it was Helen Keller who could never have seen that site, or the sites we've looked at tonight, who said no pessimist has ever sailed to an uncharted land, or reached for new discovery, or opened the human heart to new understanding. These people start here. That is still and all what it's all about. It's what I have the great good fortune to do every single day at COSI in Ohio. We touch and teach and fire sparks in 1.2 million people, old and young, per year in Ohio and 26 states and two foreign countries. It's what you do here, up on the campus and down here. Most of all, I hope, it's what each of us and all of us do every day, carrying that spark that fueled us, that curiosity, that passion, and that delight in the rewards, personal and professional, that come from daring to reach for a star. Gary, I'm delighted that you invited me to be a part of this, and I'm pleased that uh, we took a little different look at another dimension of exploration. Thank you all very much.